Welcome back, boss babes and CE bros. It's ding dong darkness time. And I'm Allison Dixon, back with part two of our class of cults coverage on multi level marketing companies. And joining me again is my lovely friend, Beverly Bamberry. Welcome back. Hello. Thank you for having me once again. And last week we did uh, Tupperware and Avon. We thought we'd start kind of on the lighter side even and go a little yeah. further back in, in history and time. But hopefully we illustrated that even the companies that we have the most um, familiar association with in terms of branding are still operating with a uh, kind of a deceptive underbelly. Also getting across the problems with MLMs and their problematic structures, the deceptive marketing surrounding their earnings, and the fact that more than 95% or so of people who become a distributor for an MLM, no matter which one, will lose money. And we also wanted to make a point of how so many of these companies prey on women by framing themselves as a perfect opportunity to make extra money while being home to take care of the kids. But this week, we really wanted to highlight a couple of companies that go just as hard at recruiting men as they do women. And they do that by fostering a culture of success at all cost and prosperity if you believe it hard enough. And at least one of them actually goes beyond qualifying as merely cultish. Uh, we're going to be talking about a full blown cult for one of these anyway. And uh, the companies that we'll be talking about are Amway and Primerica. Yeah. And Beverly, yeah, you covered Primerica, and I'm excited to hear about your coverage. I'll be talking about Amway first, but I mean, it sounds like there there's a there's a lot of neat stuff. And it's funny that you said the way that uh, they kind of focus more on male recruitment, because I think I think part of the reason that maybe men don't always realize they're being recruited into an MLM is because it's thought of as a woman thing a boss mm -hmm. babe. You know, I think men maybe think they're immune or something, but they really hit that Gordon Gecko part of the lizard brain. No pun intended with Gecko and Lizard, by the way. That's just the name of the character. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <That's> perfect. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and I think because it really is just this like greed is good, you know, make money, mm -hmm. lose all your friends. And guess what? It's just like the same MLMs that the ladies are doing. So anyways, fun Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Very much so. I love that you brought that up. And I also, before I start talking about about Amway, I want to talk about something called survivorship bias, mm. which I think that MLMs in particular feed upon. And Amway, when we get to that, you'll see. But survivorship bias, um, you might have seen a meme on the internet of a drawing of an airplane that has a bunch of red dots on it that are centered around sort of the middle part of the plane or the wings and whatnot. And it's basically a diagram of a like a World War II plane, and all the areas that it had been shot. And they were asking people, where should we focus the armoring of the plane based on this diagram? And people automatically said, we should put the, the armor where the red dots are. And they were like, well, no, because these are the ones that actually survived. We need to put the armor where the dots aren't, because that, those are the planes that actually uh, did not survive. What you're doing is you, with, with survivorship bias, you tend to look at the survivors or the successful cases of a particular group, yeah. and you apply that to the whole group. They don't want you to see the failures. They only want you to see the successes. MLMs thrive on that. And the way I would say that ties into cult behavior, though, because that's how we're bringing it all together. When you're in a cult-like situation or a cult-ish situation, you know, there are people who are treated nicely, people who are treated well, who are courted. Like, for example, please don't sue me, Scientology. I'm really broke. Um, <clears throat> Tom Cruise, I'm sure, has never been treated the way other folks in Scientology have been treated, right? Absolutely. So he's like, well, I'm fine. They've never done anything bad to me. And you see that in different situations over and over again, where like a certain top layer might get treated a certain way and, and kind of not really see some of the abuses that are happening. Or perhaps more often, they put on blinders because those aren't affecting them. But uh, it, yes. it's really very similar. That survivorship bias. I actually did not know that term. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah, it, it's one that isn't covered as much, I think, as some of the other logic fallacies and things that mm -hmm. you see. And it's 
so important to know about because I think we all find ourselves possibly engaging in this, even in our daily lives, when you're reading Amazon reviews on a product, for instance, you're interested in, and you're only reading the five star reviews, <laughs> and you're thinking, oh, this is a good product, take a moment and read the one and two stars too, because you know, you could be seeing something and a lot of people are sort of incentivized to give five star mm-hmm. reviews, even if it's a verified purchase. Amazon's tried to crack down on some of this stuff, but you, you got to be careful. And, you know, Amway in particular is probably the biggest MLM in the world, short for American Way. It's not the oldest, but it is certainly the most layered and complex. These people have found a way to insert themselves into so many levels of consumership, political structures, Mm -hmm. and they're all over the world. And as we get into their history and what all they're involved in and the the various scandals, um, you'll find that Amway has largely survived the last 30 or so years by hiding their name as much as possible behind various screens. Yeah, because it's funny because when you said you were going to do Amway, I was like, are they still around? Because I feel like I haven't heard mm-hmm. of them in so long. So I'm super excited to hear about those layers. Um, quick question. Oh. What state are they headquartered in? Is it Michigan or Indiana? The reason I'm asking you that while you look is I swear to goodness me that I have driven by a bunch of stuff that was like Amway this, Amway that. And so it made me wonder like if I've been there. Yeah, they're based in Michigan, uh, Ada, Michigan. But they also own the Orlando Magic uh, basketball team on the NBA. (gasps) My home state. Exactly. And their stadium is the Amway. That's right. That's right. That's right. I don't really follow a lot of sports. Like I know I'd heard of it, but yeah, you know, and I've driven through actually Michigan a number of times. So that, that is probably Mm -hmm. what it is then because, you know, I have a lot of friends there, been to conventions there, that kind of thing. So, Oh, Michigan. I love Michigan, but yeah, there's some, there's some kooky stuff up there, but I love, love it. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's the home of, of Amway. And also of the last name that you'll be hearing quite a bit as I talk here is DeVos. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. De- I forgot that DeVosses are involved because when I was in Grand Rapids for a convention like, before the pandemic, everything was DeVos, DeVos, DeVos. And I was like, seriously, mm-hmm. seriously, do I got to look at this woman's name? Because it was, you know, Betsy DeVos was the one that I knew at the time. Exactly. She is the daughter of the co founder, Richard DeVos. Oh, and of course, they're part of this big time. Um, in fact, what I hope to do is when I wrap back around my end discussion here is to kind of show really the the way that the DeVos family has insinuated themselves into a lot. You know, people don't talk about them in the same breath as the, say, the Koch brothers, Mm -hmm. um, but they're very much on that level Mm -hmm. of influence and wealth. But they started in 1949, Jay Van Andel and Richard DeVos. They'd been friends since high school and college and they went into business together on a number of different ventures. They they did a hamburger stand. They did uh, a sailing business. They did air charters and things like that. And then they discovered a company called Neutralite. And they sell food supplements, you know, shakes and pills mm. and vitamins and all that fun stuff. And so they started to become distributors for Neutralite. So it's interesting that the founding of this MLM is based on them working for wow. another MLM. And they made a few sales, but they weren't really into it, you know. <laughs> So, they so figured out you familiar. gotta be at the top of the pyramid. I mean the triangle. I mean, um, you know, to yeah. make money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And so they started going to different seminars and things in Chicago and some other major cities. And they got themselves a sponsor and they started watching all these promotional films and don't go into all these different talks and talking to very successful distributors of these products. And so they decided, okay, we'll actually become for real Neutralite business distributors. Mm -hmm. And so in 1949, they've formed a corporation called the Ja Re Corporation, which is just abbreviated from their first names. It's the most unoriginal. Creative. white guy <laughs> stupid corporation name you could ever think of yeah and they set this up because they were going to work in import export which isn't shady at all no. like importing you Always know wooden items from south american countries <laughs> okay 
<laughs> I'm sure there's no like cocaine stuffed in any of those things, but you know, we'll, we'll, you know, leave that for another thing. I'm clutching but, my uh, pearls. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. The pearl parties. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. Ah, too. <laughs> I forgot about those too. I have a friend who's been into that. Anyways, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. What well, actually in our third episode, I think we'll do like a grab bag of some of the more wacky cults. There or, you I'm go. sorry, cults and MLMs. <laughs> um, I, didn't mean to totally confuse those words, but you know, they're Yay. almost synonymous. And so they turned their import export business into a neutralite distribution company. And after that, though, they started having uh, some talks with some of the other distributors. And there were some questions around some of the problems with the Neutralite products. There were people that weren't, you know, happy with them. They would eventually become the subject of an FDA investigation on the quality of their products and the problems that they were causing people. Yeah. Um, so they started an organization with 5,000 other distributors of Neutralite. And they created a group called the American Way Association, or Amway. Mm -hmm. And in April of 1959, they started to do research and development on other products. So enter their cleaning products, like the dish soap and the That's laundry what detergent. I associate them with the most. In fact, for the longest time, I thought Amway was like ammonia or something because I thought of clean. Yeah. Because I mean, when I was a kid, like I wasn't, you know. But yeah, so that's interesting. I, I mean, I remember too. I think that's the when the first thing people say, well, what did Amway do? I'm like, yeah, aren't they? Is it like carpet shampoo yeah. or weird, you know, cleaning mm -hmm. stuff? I don't know. I just remember seeing all these bottles of yep. like cleaners, you know. And their first product was called Frisk, which uh, was actually developed in Ohio. And DeVos and Van Andel, they bought the rights to manufacture and distribute Frisk. But then they eventually changed the name to LOC, which stands for Liquid Organic Cleaner. Frisk was a much better name. These guys do not know how to brand they're shit. They're very bad at it. <laughs> they yes, just... they're very bad. <laughs> like, come on, LOC. Just... I mean, Frisk sounds like <laughs> way more of a good time, to be honest. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. than <laughs> LOC. <laughs> But they um, then started to form other corporations within the corporations. So uh, that would help them handle uh, things like insurance and other benefits for their distributors and things. And then in 1960, they purchased a ha like a 50% share in the Atco Manufacturing Company, which is based in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And they changed its name to Amway Manufacturing Corporation. And that's so that they could manufacture more of the soaps and the products and things. Mm -hmm. And so by 1965, there were like five different Amway companies that merged to form the singular Amway corporation because they had a sales corporation, they had a services corporation, a manufacturing corporation, they had all yeah. these things and they merged it all. And then jump forward another decade, they buy a controlling interest in Neutralite. The company they first started selling oh, for. Good little Neutralite they bought, is still here. Yeah, and Neutralite is still very much a thing. Oh. They bought that controlling interest in 1972, and then they fully took it over in 1994. So Ooh. what's interesting about this acquisition is not only did they get the Neutralite products and branding and all that stuff, and also this was after the FDA had investigated Neutralite, by the way, for very problematic things going on with their supplements. Amway bought them anyway. They did not care. <laughs> that That's pretty messed up. But not only did they buy Neutralite, the wife of the founder of Neutralite, her name is Edith Renberg. Her husband was Carl Renberg. He was the Neutralite founder. She owned a cosmetics company that she developed in 1968 called the Edith Renberg Cosmetics Company. And then when Neutralite merged with Amway in 1972, they bought controlling interest of that makeup company and changed the name to Artistry Brand oh. Cosmetics. And that brand is, again, selling billions of dollars yep. worth of cosmetics 
to this day. They've had sponsorships uh, with people like Sandra Bullock. Mm -hmm. They have featured with the Oscars, New York Fashion Week. I mean, they've sponsored Miss America competitions. I never knew that was part of the Amway Corporation in some way. That is wild. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so they, they got all of that whenever they bought Neutralite. So at this point, Amway has expanded tremendously in already the MLM product world and they're buying up other products, but they're not putting their name on those products. Here's a listing real quick of the products they own. They have Amway Home, which is their their cleaning line. Mm-hmm. That's the one that remains it. They have one. This is a horrible name. Glister. Ew. Uh, I've heard of that, but ew. ew. Uh. <laughs> that's a uh, dental care. Uh, oh, line. That's right. That's so, right. Yep. Glister. That just sounds like a nasty skin growth. Glisterine, but yeah, but glister also sounds like blister, y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's not something I want to put in my mouth, you know. Uh, then they have a GNH, which I'm not quite sure what that one does. Uh, just yet. there's Neutralite. That's their biggest seller still. And here's here's an interesting thing too, and why they suck is Neutralite uh, products. They have like protein powders, you know, like plant-based uh, protein powder, you know, you might want to mm-hmm. have to go with your workouts or whatever, right? They charge like twice as much for a very mediocre product. I mean, you can go to anywhere, go to any GNC, go to any grocery store and buy a huge can of plant-based yep. uh, protein powder and pay a fraction of the price. Yep, exactly right. Well, and when you got a big giant organization to pay for, I guess, like you got to charge too much. Absolutely, absolutely. And then we have artistry as mentioned before. And then there's eSpring, which is a water filtration company. They make water filters and they've actually rated pretty decently on Consumer Reports products, but their names are buried under so many other sub names Mm. and other investors but Amway's behind it all. So you might see these products and go, oh, that's, you know, that's no big deal. That's nothing. Well, no, um, that's very much a an Amway product. And then XS, which is an energy drink, and they, they bought that up out of a California-based company. And it's been sold as an Amway product since 2003. And as of January 2015, it's been distributed in 38 countries and genu- generates annual sales of $150 million. And it was actually considered the first uh, sugar-free energy drink to be sold uh, globally. And what's interesting is they found an opportunity at marketing this to college kids. Oh, so right. <laughs> this is how they get in to that realm, too. But in order for them to do this as effectively as they do, to have all these different brands under them, they changed their name back in, let's see, what year is this? In 1999. Now, one sec. By they, by they, do you mean XS or Amway in general? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Amway in general. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. You're totally fine. I'll first establish that by 1999, they'd already had a number of uh, lawsuits and other problems with the FTC well before this. And I'll cover that in a second. But I mainly want to get the other branding stuff out of the way Mm -hmm. so that people can know right away that Amway is everywhere and in everything. They changed their name in 1999 to Quickstar. Q-U-I-X-T-A-R. I've heard that name. Yeah. And they had another holdings company called Altacore. And they launched multiple companies off of that. And it was all a way to sort of uh, shield where people were getting their products. So you could say that you're selling eSpring water filters that you're ordering from Quickstar, but it's really Amway. It just has a lot, like it's for me as a marketing person, as a, as a publicist, as somebody who works on branding with clients, like the absolute antithesis of branding is hiding your name. Isn't it like, like Mm -hmm. if you're hiding who you are, then that says a whole lot about what your brand is thought of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, because we see regular corporations will do stuff like a lot of them absorb other companies or Google Mm -hmm. uh, exists underneath uh, their parent company alphabet, but they don't hide from that alphabet. It has similar logoing. It has very, it's just a way for Google to house all of its brands under one umbrella. But this is definitely a lot more uh, deceptive yes. because uh, and the reason that Amway had to do all that uh, subterfuge in the first place 
goes way back into the 70s. And in the 70s, now, at this point, you know, they are definitely working on the direct sales model. And Mm -hmm. there's a good bit of pyramid type behavior happening. And they started catching the attention of the FTC and the good old FTC, who we mentioned, the Federal Trade Commission mentioned back in episode one. And they looked into Amway to see if they were actually a a legal pyramid scheme and went to court. There was a landmark decision that was handed down in 1979. There was an opportunity with this court case to not only shut Amway down, Mm -hmm. but to end the existence of any multi-level marketing company in this country. But by this point, Amway already had a very significant financial footprint and was in a lot of people's pockets. And just a quick aside, the president at the time was, I believe, Gerald Oh, no, no, no. It was Jimmy Carter by then. Never mind. Yeah. I was going to say Gerald Ford is from Michigan, too. And maybe there's a secret oh. connection. But actually, it was Jimmy Carter. Never mind. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there's no doubt, though, and that they have bought and lobbying uh, lobbyists oh, and whatnot yeah. have bought a lot of politicians. And we'll get into that, too, because that's a very big part of things. But in 1979, the judge found in that case that uh, although there were some deceptive practices going on, Amway didn't qualify as an illegal um, pyramid scheme because they had uh, products to sell and they didn't require a huge buy in. And it wasn't like they were making it a requirement, quote unquote, that you had to recruit other distributors. And so because of that case, every MLM that exists to this day has Amway and the FTC to thank for it. And Amway is perfectly happy to let people know that they are the ones that have made everyone else to this day possible. And to this day, the FTC still doesn't do jack shit about these companies. There's really nothing they can do because they can say, you know, oh, well, as long as you have a product, then, (laughs) you know, they go after certain things. They go after the marketing, but they don't go after this problematic structure of these companies because Mm -hmm. let's talk about the structure. Let's go back again. We're going back to that (laughs) pyramid shape, girl. And Amway is dogged with how they recruit people it is literally a cult and i again um you know i've said time and time again throughout the cult series on this uh, that that word is often shorthand to refer to certain behaviors and belief sets uh, within a group but everything that amway does falls under the definition of controlling cult behavior and they come to you You might even be in a grocery store looking at buying maybe a bottle of vitamin C or something like Mm -hmm. that. And you'll be approached by someone who's dressed very nicely and seems very friendly and is just kicking off a conversation. And then all of a sudden, maybe they'll, you know, say, hey, you know, want to have a coffee or maybe we can talk a little more. And before you know it, you're being pitched Mm -hmm. on this great opportunity. And they're doing it by telling you how perfect you are for it. They're love bombing you. They're appealing to your desire to be successful, to make more money. And there are countless stories like this on Reddit of of the way people have been recruited into these groups. But that's where it starts. And they bring you in. And the indoctrination begins hardcore from that point on. So it's, it's so frustrating to hear so many of these stories about some of the ways that people have been manipulated Mm -hmm. into selling Amway. And a lot of people now they're using all these other company names. So people don't even know it's Amway until well, after they've been roped in. Because Amway had already kind of ruined its name in the 70s and 80s, it became synonymous with a pyramid scheme. So when, like we said, we know when you have to do that, you know, it's a problem. Last week I talked about Avon and how really I didn't have bad memories about it at all. Like my mom had, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the the only problem with with Avon initially was that my mom just has no self-control about purchasing things and that's on her. (laughs) But um, but, uh, I remember and I must have been five-ish, six-ish because I was super young. So maybe around 1980-ish. I remember Mm -hmm. my parents having like these people over and suddenly there's boxes of like Amway stuff around and my parents actually seemed really unhappy like like the overriding thing I remember from this is that 
my parents seemed stressed and unhappy about it. I'm guessing mm-hmm. it, that it didn't last long because I don't remember much else, but thinking that kind of got roped into it. And they were very young parents. Like my, I mean, my mom was probably only 23, 24 at the time and they, and we were poor. And of course they were feeling, you know, very vulnerable financially and they had very little financial literacy. And so at some point I, I should ask them about it, but at some point, yes, I remember much sadness and stress related to Amway in my early childhood. There really is no good feeling for a lot of people that come into this because first of all, there's so many things that I could end up expounding upon uh, in terms of philosophies and topics related to the way that this company does business. Mm -hmm. We'll start with the prosperity gospel. Um, Mm -hmm. And I will say that, yes, Amway is very much a religious company. Mm -hmm. They might not put scripture into everything up front, but when you start attending their uh, meetings, when you start listening to their motivational uh, materials and their supplemental books and things like that, you really start to see that what they're implanting into people's minds is that when you sell Amway products, you are doing righteous things. Mm -hmm. You are fulfilling a covenant with God that when you are prosperous, when you have money, then you are on the right path. It's the, it's the thing that televangelists like Joel Osteen and Benny Hinn and so many of these rich assholes that have, you know, Ferraris and giant (sighs) mansions while preaching the, preaching the gospel. It drives me insane. Like I, I am non-religious now, but I went to Catholic school. School. And I recall the Jesus I learned about being a dude who, who was cool with the poor and was like, yeah. you know, the, the what I forget what all the different sayings are, but like you're more likely are, to uh, pass a camel through the yeah, eye, yeah, eye yeah, of a yeah. needle. It's like it's like Jesus Christ's gospel was never about prosperity. And the fact that so many thousands and thousands and thousands, possibly millions of people seem to buy mm-hmm. into that now is just a testament to how vulnerable the human brain is to certain types of behaviors, i.e. cult-like behaviors. Absolutely. And to really drive home, I found a, an account of a poster on Reddit, and they did it under a, a throwaway. So I can't gotcha. quite share exactly who they are. I can mm-hmm. post a you know link to the post on, on the show notes. But they talked about how very um, strong the indoctrination is with the prosperity gospel, as well as this idea that you only are allowed to have positive thoughts. And so we talk about toxic positivity, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. If you allow the negative thoughts in, then that's going to remove your power in some way. Words have power. They even talk about how, and this happened in like some of these Amway meetings, there were people that would talk about how if they go to the doctor, the doctor is not allowed to tell them that they have a disease or that they have something wrong with them. They're not allowed to say the words or hear the words even, because if somebody says you have cancer then you have removed my superpower, even though maybe I'll still do the chemo, but you're not allowed to tell me I have cancer. That is literally what they're saying. Wow, yeah. And this is the kind of stuff that she faced while going to these meetings. And they also, of course, while doing all this, now I will say going back to that 1979 court case where the FTC, uh, it was found that they were not a legal pyramid scheme. They were slapped with a few um, sanctions okay. and uh, penalties. And one of those is that because when you go to any MLM website, every one of them will show some sort of an earning, like a truthful earning statement that you could, ex- things that you could expect to make. Except Money A-Long. you can expect to make. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And see, p- companies have found a way to get around that requirement. See, mm-hmm. there's always a loophole. Yep. Um, but they had to do that um, because Amway requires you, for instance, that for every 150 people you sell to, you have to sell to 50 of them in order to make the legal threshold mm. that you are not a pyramid scheme. You have to be able to sell them products directly you can't say that your earnings came from uh commissions from Mm. other distributors under you Mm -hmm. it has to be actual sold product right so that's one of the things the ftc slapped them with and that uh, you know kind of affected the industry well 
affected the industry majorly in every mm-hmm. single way this court case did. Yeah. She talked about that, but she talked about the religious indoctrination. She talked about after you develop a customer base, you have to start discreetly catching up with people via, you know, text, social media, voice calls, and then start probing people in your life. Hey, are you interested in making some extra money? Um, and then if they say yes, you pers- pursue further. If they mm-hmm. say no, you move on. You know, this is all standard MLM stuff. But here's sure. the thing where this gets deeper. And I'm not sure how many other MLMs are quite like this. But this is where they become much, very much a cult. They tell you that the people that aren't supporting your business Mm -hmm. need to be cut out of your life. Yep. And another thing that they will do is they encourage people, uh, the IBOs, the independent business owners Mm -hmm. is what Amway salespeople are called, to leave their families and go set up in another state to grow their business <laughs> that is at, they, like explicitly they have stated yes. that see like I, oh, feel, yes. I feel like that it ends up happening with a lot of other mlms because mm-hmm. you alienate people uh or right. you know your your in-group folks will be like oh don't mind the haters you know but to hear that they actually explain Explicitly said that is just absolutely mind boggling and awful. Oh, yeah. And they will also um, like it's part of their marketing uh, that they give out to prospective uh, sellers. They'll even say you have time away from your family as as part of a perk when, you know, wasn't it supposed to be you were supposed to spend more time with your family because you don't have to work an actual job. And that's the other thing, too, is they hate jobs. The, right. Then that's the, the thing they'll rope people in and say, oh, you want to work for someone else? And, you know, they start putting all these mental tactics in your brain of like, oh, if I didn't make this work, then it's because I didn't try hard enough. Here, listen to more tapes, listen to more, you know, books, you know, read more materials, go to another meeting, you know, I'll see Facebook posts that people screenshot for these uh, anti MLM groups on Reddit, for instance, and, you know, about how, oh, I was feeling kind of down about everything, because I'm losing so much money. And it, this just isn't working. Then I talked to my mentor. And after a few hours, man, I was really feeling it. I was I, I felt like I could just go and take over the world. And it's like, Oh, you just got reprogrammed, my guy, Mm -hmm. you know, like, good good going, good going. So much of this is tied into recruiting groups of people to be under you and build this massive pyramid. It is a massive pyramid. Mm -hmm. And what we have found, too, is that once you get to a certain level, you are completely locked out. There is a very exclusive club of distributors, I would say probably a couple dozen or so that are part of this very exclusive group they make the most money Mm -hmm. they have the most influence and nobody can join and you know why because the people below them are paying the top levels right and if they bring them in then their money's gonna go away yep and they always have to be replenishing the lower level because so many people quit yep but you have to keep them in and keep them under control and you're using things like religion and you know very strict doctrine and Mm -hmm. very very explicit mind control techniques that are documented by you know cult experts and exit counselors that's you know like Stephen hassan uh that i've mentioned in previous episodes Mm -hmm. that he talks about capitalist cults and that's what these are yeah reminds me of teal swan and wait not to just be like that's the only other thing i've ever been on your show about but like because she has that really like tight inner group not that they aren't mm-hmm. mistreated, mind you, but uh, this very tight inner group that she works very hard to control and keep around her. And uh, everyone else are maybe a prospect, maybe not, but they're what uh, brings in the money. So Throughout the 90s, they're getting slapped with various fines because they're breaking the rules that the FTC imposed on them. Because, of course, they are. Because the fines don't mean it. all they have to do is pay the fine. We're talking like a $100,000 fine. Which is nothing for, when you're making that you kind know, of money. Violation. Yeah. Nothing at all, right? And in the meantime, they are buying politicians, uh, largely Republican politicians. They're huge in the Republican Party. And again, mentioning the DeVos name, Betsy DeVos Mm -hmm. was our Secretary of Education appointed by Donald Trump. And there's a goddamn good reason for that. And I'll tell you why. And I'm going to use her own words that she spoke back in 1998 in an article that Mother Jones published called Tough Sell. And they're talking about the political influence, the millions and millions of dollars that Amway has spent to buy politicians. 
And her and here is her quote. I know a little something about soft money, as my family is the largest single contributor of soft money to the National Republican Party. Betsy DeVos wrote in an op ed for Capitol Hill newspaper Roll Call. I have decided, however, to stop taking offense at the suggestion that we are buying influence. Now I simply concede the point. They are right. We do expect some things in return. We expect to foster a conservative governing philosophy consisting of limited government and respect for traditional American virtues. We expect a return on our investment. We expect a good and honest government. Furthermore, we expect the Republican Party to use the money to promote these policies and, yes, to win elections. People like us must surely be stopped. Wow. She said the quiet part out loud. (laughs) She very much did in 1998, mind you. And Mm -hmm. then she later goes on to become a very integral part of the cabinet of our government. And her father, yes, they donated millions of dollars of soft money to the Republican Party as individual donors. And that's not even getting into, you know, all the other uh, dark money and, you know, political action, you know, committee stuff and, uh, and whatnot that they are in. And they have done that by ensuring that if they get someone like Betsy DeVos into education, then she gets to set the guidelines that get taught, the things that get taught to kids for generations. Yep. And we're already seeing the poison fruit that that tree is bearing right now. Yeah. And you get somebody who is a major part of this company, this MLM, this very subversive tentacled beast. It's infuriating. I'm, I'm, I can't even find words now. I'm just so fucking mad every time i re- i start to sit down and do my homework on this particular company i'm like yes you compared them to scientology and that is exactly what they are and how they behave and honestly they're very much as litigious as scientology uh, too not surprised they like to, to sue people for yeah. saying mean things about them but i'm nobody so come at me bitch yeah like, uh, <laughs> like i said i'm super broke don't see me like <laughs> there are So many more things that I could say about the harm uh, that they have caused around the globe that, you know, China has is being very much affected by the actions of Amway. And and when we talked last week about how their laws are being loosened, they used to crack down on these companies. Yeah, they used to do that um, until Amway came along and started gradually loosening those restrictions. And I also will recommend another podcast that covered Amway in in multiple parts and did a great job and also just talked about pyramid schemes in general. Mm -hmm. It's called The Dream. Oh, yeah. And Mm -hmm. um, it's a great show. And I think they cover all kinds of other um, things, but they did some a really good dive on Amway. And we'll also just say, too, that if you think of things like The Secret or any sort of that law of attraction, Mm that sort of power of positive thinking, you start getting into the power of prosperity, the power of success. Those are all pipelines that lead directly to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we're talking people, thousands of people that have gone bankrupt, that have lost their families, that have lost their homes, that have lost so much because they bought into something like this and got in so far over their heads. The literature that Amway is legally required to publish that you can expect to make about $85 a month while doing this. Even though they're telling you that if you just follow our rules to the letter, Mm -hmm. then you're going to be rich and retire early and you'll never work another day in your life. And it's bullshit. It is Mm -hmm. a fucking lie. But anyway, that's that's the that's the positive story of the American Way Corporation. And I will have so many links to this so that hopefully you can educate yourself on all the guises that these companies take. Mm-hmm. Because if you're hearing from Quickstar, if you're hearing from uh, was it worldwide uh, brand distributors, that's another one mm-hmm. that is uh, that's an Amway front. There are so many fronts. But they all lead to the same ugly, ugly beast. I do have a question, though, because I know when er, when we got started and we were talking about how like this one tends to appeal to like a lot of men. Did you look in see any of like the verbiage or the kinds of materials that they use? I would be curious to kind of hear some of the um, the copy the sort of like the way that they're pitched essentially yeah i mean it it, they they are told 
uh, any of the recruits are told it, you target it to who you're going after. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, you look for people that are hungry mm-hmm. for money and success. And so they will tailor that to whomever they're talking to if they're coming at it from a man's perspective and and i am reading this like from the the men and the women Mm -hmm. uh, that have been in amway you can definitely tell that they cater it toward whoever they're going directly after so a man you know will be like do you want to provide you want to be a provider you want to you know you want to do uh you know take care of this take care of that they definitely come after it from the perspective of like be the man in, of your household, you know, mm. that sort of thing with the women. It's, you know, they use very similar because they prescribed a very uh, conservative gender roles within the organization. I was, I was just thinking, well, I mean, you know, they do the whole Republican thing. So yes, yes. And, you know, they're told how to dress, they're told how to behave in, in public and Amway actually puts very strict requirements on their sellers to not use the Amway name or logo or anything associated with what they do without permission. So they control wow. the brand to, to a very strict level. And there's another one that I wanted to bring attention to. There was a former Amway distributor who started writing a blog and a lot of them have just talking about their experiences and everything. And this one website was how to become a good Amway cult leader. <laughs> and she had a list. And I'll just read a few things from that list okay. uh, to give you an idea of an insider's perspective. Number one, absolute dictatorship. This was mostly clear to me from our sack of shit platinum is what she <laughs> calls this person the platinum is the higher member on your up sure. one or the yeah. person above you mm-hmm. platinums and diamonds and all that uh who we heard speak more than we heard any other speaker emerald or diamond and emerald is below a diamond so um Anyway, he demanded everyone in his downline to, quote, ask permission before doing anything, constantly telling us to, quote, submit to upline and never question the upline. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, Number two, no accountability. It's okay to brag about your accomplishments, bank account, material possessions, business profits, etc., but never show proof to anyone who asks. If anyone in your downline asks for proof, fall back on never question the upline. Number three, intolerance for questions. Never question the upline. Who do you think you are asking me something like that? Everything I say is the truth. And then let's see, incite unreasonable fear about the world outside of Amway. This is where the cult thing is. Our platinum was always preaching about impending catastrophe, evil conspiracies, and all things negative all the time. What else is out there except Amway? The answer to everyone's prayers. Financial security for the rest of your life. Everyone else is doomed to have a J-O-B and work for someone else. Also, too, must be able to lecture long sermons about negativity. Negativity is the main topic at Amway meetings. Doom and gloom. Business is shutting down. Social Security won't be there when you retire, etc. You need to stick with us because we are safe. Here's a good one, too. Must be good at insults, particularly mocking people who leave Amway. Mm-hmm. There is no legitimate reason to leave. Not when success is right around the corner. See, that's how they keep you on. Yep. You just keep going a little longer. Amway cult followers are always wrong in leaving. And besides that, they're also negative and evil. A good platinum cult leader must ensure his cult followers understand that the people who leave Amway are quitters, losers, broke losers, negative, dream stealers, etc. Uh, who did we have as a president? Uh, recently who called everybody a loser i mean it was like the the first you know i mean it's just like the it's like their well, first I, resort i was gonna you know? say that kind of was the theme of of the trump presidency in a way is oh everything's so scary you need me you know kind of a thing i could see how trump would love amway because what they're doing is selling a bunch of bullshit products that I mean, he tried to do the exact same oh, thing, yeah. but he failed at it. Oh, yeah. But you know, Amway succeeded everywhere that he failed. Um, I, I honestly think he sees this as the perfect American company. And they say must be comfortable destroying other people's finances, including but not limited to encouraging cult followers to run up credit card debt, take mm. out line of credit or bank loans, telling them to skip mortgage payments so they can buy more Amway products or attend the next function, etc. And you have to buy 
the pr- products yep. to use personally. That is required. You have to use their products and they're not cheap. So you're ordering their products for you to use. You have to attend the events. If you don't attend the events or get the signups that you need, you'll never get up to the next level. Sure. And they push that hard. You have to go to these things and they cost a lot of money. And yeah, they will tell people you can be a little late on your rent and your other bills. This is more important. You'll catch up. I've heard other MLMs, uh, uh, upline people have said like in everyone, I think I've read about at some point, like LuLaRoe or whatever these, Mm -hmm. and, and it's just like, it's just shockingly bad financial advice for people who are claiming to want to bring you financial stability and strength. And, you know, they did the same thing with at Lure LaRoe with trying to interfere in marriages. Like they would say, you need to leave your husband because mm-hmm. he's dragging down your business. But they wanted the husbands to be a part of it. But right. if they weren't, then, you know, you you had to leave and they would punish like Amway does the same thing. They would punish people who refused to leave their uh, spouses that weren't playing oh along. God. Yeah. And of course, no one is allowed to win an argument with the leader. You as a member are, mm-hmm. are trying to express concerns to the leadership. That's a no, no, you're not going to get anywhere doing that. I was going to say it's again with the teal swan thing, though. Remember that mm-hmm. one scene? And now I will say there is some potential evidence that that scene was edited in a weird way. So I'm going to just stick mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I, I I wasn't there. However, in the way right. that we saw it, and in other scenes that I think are pretty much just long takes, we see that anybody who questions anything is just smacked mm-hmm. right down. It's smacked right down. You don't ask questions. And that's yeah, absolutely. And if you do that, then the love bombing stops, too. Mm-hmm. Because that's mm-hmm. the other thing is, you know, once once an organization tells you to get rid of all the doubters and the haters and don't look at the failures because you know only look at the successful people again the survivorship bias once you do that and you've ostracized yourself from everything that you had before and you don't make this work then you also lose access to all the people that claim to be your family but they're ready to cut you loose the second that you start to run astray and so then you start to engage again the sunk cost fallacy of like oh god i've already spent so much money and ever i have to make this work i have to make this work well it's not gonna work and by the time that you have gotten yourself in deep enough with amway you've already probably lost thousands of dollars you're never gonna get back and the only way that you can really stop it is to just cut it off yeah and accept the loss that you gave up a lot of money and a lot of friends and family Yeah, to enrich these assholes. And the saddest part, and here's where my heart just breaks for folks who end up getting taken in by this, is just, you know, when that happens, it, when it doesn't work, and it won't, like ultimately it mm-hmm. won't, when it doesn't work and you're broke and you need support and love and caring and acceptance from your loved ones, they're going to be hesitant to give it because you've burned so many of the bridges and uh, right. it's really sad. And you're, you can end up just feeling completely isolated and, and it's, it's just awful. Honestly, it's just so awful. People that are, are brought into these things are brought in usually um, having their best intentions manipulated. Right. Mm-hmm. Everybody just wants to be able to take care of their families and survive. And these are predators looking at those people and going, mm-hmm. ha ha ha, suckers. And I want to say one more thing before we move on to Primerica. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, because, because, again, just to show the way that the DeVosses and Amway have infiltrated our government and continue to try to influence our government in terms of the way that MLMs are treated or investigated. The DeVos has uh, supported an amendment in the U.S. House of Representatives Financial Services Appropriations Bill in 2018 uh, that would have limited the ability of the FTC to investigate whether MLMs are pyramid schemes. The amendment would have barred the Treasury Department, the Justice Department, the Small Business Administration, the Security and Exchange Commission, Uh, the FTC or any other agencies from using any money to take enforcement actions against pyramid operations for the fiscal year. Why on earth would the DeVos's want to back a bill like this, right? 
they adopted provisions from the so-called Anti-Pyramid Scheme Promotion Act of 2016, which would blur the lines between legitimate MLM activity and pyramid schemes established under the original 1979 FTC case by deeming sales made to people inside the company as sales to an ultimate user, thus erases that distinction made when we're talking about sales to customers Mm -hmm. and sales to distributors. So you would automatically just be able to say, this is just money. It doesn't matter. This whole bill. And that's how all of these MLMs get away with that kind of thing then. And here it is. Here's where the law allows it. And and so here they are trying to chip away again and again. And they'll continue to try to chip away. Oh, yeah. Uh, The amendment was composed by consumer interest groups and truthandadvertising.org and all that. So this is something that is happening enough. And it will be attached to some bill that you'll miss it. Mm -hmm. And it will go, it'll just suddenly be there one day. And so this is the stuff you have to look out for and why, you know, one day you'll be seeing more MLM products and, you know, being sold as legitimate ones Mm -hmm. with this business structure that is so destructive and cult-like. So, wow. um, So keep an eye on your government. And yeah, Amway is just really trying to help make it easier to scam as many people as possible. Scamway. Amway, what's the difference? <laughs> so, <laughs> ah, okay. Yes, let's do that, Primerica, what have you. <laughs> okay. Let's dance around the burning fires of MMs. <laughs> so, I have seen Primerica offices around. In fact, I live close to one. And so they always just seem like, oh, they're just this nice, legitimate financial services company, whatever. But I started hearing as I started researching more about multi level marketing, as I learned about it and and beca- started to find it so objectionable. So I heard people mentioning Primerica, and I was like, really? So they claim they are not an MLM. They're wrong, of course, and we're going to talk about it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> yeah, they do a bunch of stuff. Their main product is life insurance. Right. That's what I have associated with yep, them. That's, was, yeah, their, that's their big thing is life insurance. But they do mm-hmm. like debt consolidation, investment funds, long-term care insurance, like prepaid legal service, like they've got, you know, a few things. Okay. So essentially after many, many, many mergers and acquisitions of many various financial companies, um, in 1987, it finally actually became the company we know as Primerica. And I'm not going to go over the details of before, because honestly, it doesn't matter because it didn't start doing what it does officially really until about this time. Now, its new CEO at that point, just just fun fact that is not MLM related, but their CEO in 87, after they um, went public for the first time and became Primerica, was named Gerald Tsai. Uh, that's T-S-A-I. And he was the first Chinese American to lead a Dow Jones company. So that is oh, a fun fact. So good on them, even though I'm yeah. sure he was probably all up in this financial structure, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, damn, okay. And then, well, congrats on one hand, but on the other hand, you're scamming people. That's great. And of course, <laughs> like a year later, they get acquired again because, like, fi- the financial sector is just wild like this, man. Like, anyway, yeah. So, as the Primerica name starts to get to be better known, um, all of their companies end up being changed to that name, sort of the opposite of the Amway thing. Um, interestingly, though, at some point in the 80s, they acquired Travelers Insurance, which was like, Oh, Travelers, Whoa. that's a legitimate company. The Red Umbrella, the red yeah, umbrella Company? The umbrella, well, they, oh. don't, they don't own them anymore. But yeah, Travelers is a legitimate company. So Primerica is complicated. Again, so many financial services companies are made up of just millions, of thousands, of hundreds of tiny little other companies and stuff. So anyway. Yes, yes. But yes, they, they are no longer involved with Travelers. You're safe, guys. So anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> the first time I found that they got in trouble was actually in 1997. So once again, there are federal agencies involved. That seems to be a theme of a lot of these things. Oh, yeah. And what they got in trouble for was very telling. Okay. So there was an SEC and uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC investigation, that showed Primerica did not adequately handle complaints about their Dearborn, Michigan office. And I'm like, mm. okay. So I'm like, well, I don't know. Salespeople sometimes screw up. I'm sure this was no big deal. No friends. <laughs> According to the SEC report, beginning in the fall of 1991 through November 94, the Dearborn registered representatives, i.e. the sales reps, sold unregistered okay. securities in a, drumroll, Ponzi scheme. 
I knew it. Yeah. I knew it was a Ponzi scheme. Now, in this yeah, that, case, it looks that's like... That's why they're not an MLM. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say in this particular case, it was really just these reps who were just like, we're going to scam people. But the thing is, mm -hmm. Primerica got complaints and they investigated so shoddily that they either didn't find it or I like to wonder, did they just get a cut? And and real quick, I, I do want to let people know because people might be going, oh, what's a Ponzi scheme? Oh, uh, uh -huh. it really? So just just bare sketches here. So it's a lot like a pyramid scheme and a lot like some of these other things. But uh, in investment world, and this is why Primerica is such a, a, a case for this and why it, it's such an opportunity for a Ponzi scheme is because you're telling people, I'm going to take your money and I'm going to invest it. Mm -hmm. And so the money that you are paying to the older and people you've been investing like the for the longest, you're paying them the money that the new investors have brought in. It's yep. your the investment isn't actually growing. You, there is no investment. It's actually, if anything, losing money. Mm -hmm. um, but there was actually a, an Amway uh, dealer who got caught doing something like this. He was actually very successful wow. Amway distributor, but he was bringing in new customers into his Ponzi scheme that was based on Amway products. He actually got kicked out of Amway because uh, mm. it's you know a Ponzi scheme. There's no joke. I mean, Bernie Madoff is yep. the the poster boy of mm -hmm. it, right? So just to say, like Primerica being involved in Ponzi schemes, very easy because it's literally the crime of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yep, exactly. Is, is and when you're is. doing investments, it, you know, you give your money to somebody potentially and you don't know what happens to it until you either get it back or you don't. And eventually it runs out. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, of course, naturally, Primerica didn't really keep any records of this. And I pres or, or the, the sorry, the rep, the representatives in Dearborn. I mean, they knew they were up to no good, obviously. They, they knew what they were doing. Um, anyways, yeah. so those guys in that 91 to 94 stretch sold at least 14 different unregistered securities. And their marketing hierarchies, as it was called in the report, uh, raised around $27 million from about 2,000 investors, from more than 2,000 investors. When the scheme ended in 1994... Again, according to the SEC report, substantially all of the monies raised from investors was lost. Oh, wow. Yep. Yep. And mm -hmm. now here's where Primerica, the parent company, is uh, in trouble. On three occasions between 91 and 92, they received letters or telephone calls from other Primerica agents who were saying, uh, this dude in Dearborn is, is selling unauthorized stuff, man. Like, you got to do it. So their own people were telling on this mm -hmm. guy. And Primerica was like, oh, yeah, I don't know, it looks fine to me. Like, like they just didn't really research it. Yeah. And so the SEC was like, okay, guys, yep, you are complicit in this because of that. So, yeah, again, makes you wonder if somebody got a cut. So, anyway, so that, that, oh, was, an, of course. that was an interesting <laughs> thing that, that happened uh, with Primerica. Um, so, anyway, sort of a digression, sort of not. So, into the multi-level marketing part of it. Because they are, there are legitimate parts of the company. And here's the thing. Even their insurance is legitimate insurance like they pay out mm -hmm. claims like they they do function as an actual insurance company i was curious if they actually follow through on that they, okay, they do they do and i think they would be unable to sell insurance at all if they didn't um because it right. is it is something that's federally regulated on that level but apparently the products cost far more than most places which again, mm -hmm. like we were talking about with amway the products cost more same here okay so um primaric on its website interestingly, has a page entitled Primerica Misconceptions FAQ. Hmm. Now, if you're a company who's just doing the right thing all the time, do you need to put an FAQ up about misconceptions about your company? I would say no. no, but the first question is, is Primerica <laughs> legitimate? And what's funny is in the part, there's another part on the underneath that just says, uh, is Primerica an MLM? And they're like, no. Um, but what's funny is there there's a footnote um, next to the sentence that says it compensates its representatives based on an insurance agency model. And there's a little VI, a little Roman numeral six. And I'm like, oh, okay, footnote. Let me go see why there's a little footnote here. There was no VI. There was nothing there. It leads to nothing. It's not on the page. It stops at five. It stops at V. <laughs> Are okay. you serious? I'm not kidding. They they link, and I'm assuming this may be some sort of a clerical thing of somebody who did the website, but it's pretty damn ironic, right? So 
I looked up what is an insurance agency model? Like, what is the definition of that, right? And it turns out there really isn't one. I thought it was like going to be some term of a type of doing business. It really doesn't seem to mean any particular thing other than saying, oh, we're an agency. Okay, fine. Okay. But while I was looking for this, I found the treasure trove of evidence. Um, I found their 2021 10K filing, which, oh, sorry, a 10K, if you don't know, is essentially the annual report you have to send to the Securities and Exchange Commission every, every year, well, of course, every year does annual, sorry. <laughs> right. um, so, and, and it lays out their finances and other information, and it's, it's a regulatory requirement that all publicly traded companies have to do, okay? So, in right. their 10K of 2021, they lay out what this all means, okay? They say, unlike on their website, It is a modified insurance agency model, and it works thusly. Independent entrepreneurs are their independent sales reps who take responsibility for selling and recruiting and developing other independent sales reps. That's an MLM. Mm -hmm. Okay, managing, (laughs) and they manage their own schedules and expenses. Sounds familiar. Oh, but there's more. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is all, like, I've got a bunch of stuff to come, all taken directly from their own annual report, okay? Low barrier to entry. By offering a flexible time commitment, we are able to attract significant number of recruits who desire to earn supplemental income. They start their business with a low fee, And for that fee, they receive, you know, training and technological support. It turns out that not only is there a fee, which I think is um, $99 in the U.S. and like $130 in Canada, something like that. There's also a monthly fee, though. And it's not that high. It's like $25 and $28 between those two countries, right? But that still is this income that whether you make money or not, you're paying it to Primerica if you're one of the reps. Yeah. So uh, it says most independent sales reps begin selling products on a part-time basis, which enables them to hold jobs while exploring the entrepreneurial business opportunity mm. with us. Yeah, so they're basically don't saying, try to pay your rent off this yeah. shit because you're going to need a job. <laughs> yep. And here we go into the triangular shapes. An independent sales rep who has built a successful organization and has obtained his or her insurance and securities licenses can achieve different sales designations. So there are different levels, you see. An independent sales representative who has built a successful organization and obtained his or her licenses can achieve a sales designation of regional vice president, which qualifies him or her for a higher commission schedule. And of course, there are other levels such as senior rep, district leader, division leader, you know, just like platinum, emerald, diamond, like they all do this, right? They all do this. Exactly. Every one of them. Yep. They all have their own trademark bullshit. Yep. And then it says um, <clears throat> RVPs or excuse me, the regional vice presidents are independent contractors who open and operate offices for their sales organizations and devote their full time attention to their businesses. They also support and monitor the sales representatives on whose sales they earn commissions. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. Definitely not an MLM no. or anything shady about that at all. <laughs> yep. And I mean, there's lots of sales support and sales bonuses, which, I mean, to their credit, a lot of that stuff is normal sales organization stuff. Like, that's not all MLM stuff. But um, it does sound like they do a lot of the motivational stuff. And they even have, it said biennial. So I guess that's every other year. They have giant meetings where thousands and thousands of people have to come at their own expense. Not paid for by the company. Always, always. They can't even do that. They can't even throw one event for the people that are providing their upline with all the money. Exactly. They can't even, you know, put down some money to invest in the people below you. That's that's how, you know, like, you know, they ridicule people that have real jobs, but even the shittiest job, you know, just a a regular company will at least do something for their employees. Well, like, I... I know I, I talked about like this indoctrination process I went through when I started working at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, yeah. But I'll tell you something like and here's where this is very different. They paid for me to go to Chicago. They paid for my hotel. I had a meal allowance. They paid for my plane mm-hmm. ticket. Like I didn't pay for anything. And that's the way it's supposed to be if you're having an event for your employees. 
but they're not employees. They're independent contractors. And that's the thing too. And this is what I'll tell people. And I would love to actually, if you're down for this, actually do something uh, of an offshoot of this at some point on mm. vanity uh, presses mm. versus like small publishers, because it's a very similar thing. Like if you are, if your book is taken on by an actual publisher, whether it's a major one or a small one, the whole idea being they're taking some of that financial risk to produce your book, to mm-hmm. design the cover, do the editing, do the marketing, whatnot, and it's all stipulated in a contract and you don't pay them anything. Whereas, you know, a vanity press, you're paying for everything. Mm -hmm. You end up with a unedited book with a shitty cover and uh, that you have to sell at like twice what you would ordinarily sell a book just to make back your investment. And and you have to do all the work. And they disguise themselves now as traditional employers. You know, my, my son, he has been trying to find work you know, off and on for the last couple of years since he got out of college. And so many companies will reel you in Mm -hmm. with an actual office, some kind of a storefront, and you go in and you have this really enthusiastic Zoom meeting and they tell you how cool you are. And then you show up and you're told, oh, this is a kind of a sales thing Mm -hmm. and whatever. And no, it's a fucking MLM is what it is. And there's so many of them that hide behind names you have to dig and dig i always tell people if you have a job opportunity that seems a little weird like they're not telling you about benefits and pay Mm -hmm. and the normal traditional employer shit go to reddit and type the company name and i guarantee you it'll pop up on one of their mlm watches absolutely it will and Mm -hmm. like cutco's whole thing the knife mlm is um they actually target people who are like 18 19 20 years old like they mm-hmm. target young and experienced people into thinking yeah i'm gonna do door-to-door sales for god's sake it's the 21st century oh god yeah well now we're knowing you know you get shot for turning around in someone's driveway Hell on yeah. accident you think you're gonna right, go right? fucking sell knives i'm not letting my kid oh, i know my kid's an adult now but i'm not gonna let him go door-to-door these days. well granted we're in canada mm. so there aren't so many handguns but anyways <laughs> <laughs> but, but still, exactly. Yeah, you just but, never be okay. too sure. <laughs> so, so going on again in this document, and here's another deeply, deeply telling statement. It's um, members of our independent sales force primarily serve their friends, family members, and personal acquaintances. Of course, through individually driven networking activities. Oh my God. Because it's like, of course, you can't just be a normal insurance company selling nope. normal policies to normal people. You got to nope. do this other You got to convince everybody understand. you know to buy your shit. So, um, yeah. and then it says the large size of the independent sales force and the active recruiting of new independent sales reps. The independent sales force is continually able to access an expanding base of prospective clients without engaging in costly media channels. So, Oh, my God. Like, honestly. Mm. Okay. So, uh, and, and just to note, too, they're paying twice as much for a policy. Yeah, exactly. As... And the policies are expensive, so they're going to be hard to sell. Like, oh, again. Yeah. And, yeah, I mentioned the meetings, but they also have rings that look like Super Bowl rings or, I don't know, cl- high school oh. class rings that are like Million Dollar Club or, you know, whatever. So, again, these layers and strata. So it says right here, again, in the document, they become part of the sales organization of the sales rep who recruited them, as well as the sales organization to which the person above them belongs. Okay. They're describing yeah. an MLM, but they're like, no, we're not an MLM. We're innovative. No. Is what they're, they're like, we have an innovative compensation structure. It is not innovative. Right? Not at all. <gasps> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, and then God. it goes on to say, recruitment of independent sales reps. That's a subheading. After the initial contact, prospective recruits typically are invited to an opportunity meeting conducted in person or through remote communication tools. The objective of the opportunity meeting is to inform the prospective recruits about their mission and opportunity to start their own business. Um, And at the conclusion of the meeting, they are asked to, or or the mark, I mean, excuse me, the uh, lead, uh, <laughs> the market yeah, is exactly. uh, is asked to complete an application and p- and pay a nominal fee to commence their pre licensing and training and blah blah blah, and then it goes on to okay and more about that fee in a moment. Put a pin in that, okay? But then it goes okay. on to say right after that, recruits may become our clients or provide us with access to their friends and family and personal acquaintances. So I found. On a separate uh, website, this person who does lots of deep research, it's a different person than last time. I forget his name now. But anyways, 
Um, it says on page six of the new recruit manual. And again, this is something that was leaked that wasn't supposed to be public. Oh, um, ooh, nice. it says there is a script to be used when calling potential leads. And the opening part of the script reads, I'm currently getting my state license. And part of my requirement is to take my trainer to 10 presentations in the next week. And that is not actually true. So what happens is you get your upline in front of your warm leads. In other words, the people that are your friends and family, the people who are most likely to buy from you. And mm -hmm. then your sponsor is the one who gets those sales because you're what? not, you're not licensed yet. That's the whole thing. You should not be meeting with people until after you are licensed. So Primerica right. literally takes this from you and gives it to the person above you pretty much. And then you're expected, I guess, once you're licensed, you'll get the next marks, yep. mm -hmm. marks, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Um, like that has messed up. It is so wild wow. to me, right? Okay, so back to the fee. So I found this chart, again, in their 10K, like this is right in their government filing. And they gives the past three years, which is which is typical for this type of document. So 2019, number of new recruits was a little under 300,000. Okay. And how many yeah. people became licensed? 44,739. So that fee was collected from almost 300,000 people, but only under 50,000 actually became licensed. Okay. That's a horrible turnaround and rate. 2020 wow. is even worse. 2020, over 400,000 new recruits. And uh, remember, what was 2020, guys? That was the pandemic COVID. year. And people were deeply concerned about finances, people were feeling very unstable. And so the number mm -hmm. of people they recruited shot up because, of course, what they're doing is they're preying on vulnerable and scared people. OK, uh, anyway, yeah, they that, can work from home. Exactly. Out of that 400,000, only 48,000 became licensed. And then 2021, wow. it's 350,000 and only 40,000 become licensed. So this means they keep all of these, quote, nominal fees for people that never even become their agents. This is just so basically free for money. every 100,000 people they get to sign up. We're seeing maybe like 8,000 people something along convert those lines yep. to get licensed. That is an 8% conversion rate. And and they keep all of the, all of the fees though. All of those application fees. That's not refunded. And remind me again how much how much that fee is. In the US it's $99. Okay. okay. So again, I will so, say it's not the biggest upfront investment for an MLM. There are way worse ones, okay? But the point right. is still and again the monthly fee you pay because you have to pay this oh. other monthly fee for support. And again, it's not a ton of money, but all of this adds up for Primerica, doesn't it? It sounds like a, a Twitter blue check. Is what yeah, it sounds like. there you You're go. You're paying your monthly fee to ensure that you are quote unquote verified. And I will <laughs> say, um, I don't know if this is standard in insurance. Okay, so again, going to stipulate something I don't know here, but it says in their filing also um, that they pay out their commissions on the term life insurance only the first year of the policy. So you only get that commission the one time and you have to keep selling. You don't get the residual income if they renew. Now, apparently, oh. apparently there are some writers that may allow for that, but it's not the standard. And again, I don't know if that if that's normal. That may be normal. I, I did was not able to research insurance sales in general. I just didn't really have the time for that. So uh, but to me, that still seems kind of fishy because it's like if you're getting residual income from renewals, shouldn't you get a chunk of that too? Like agreed. It seems like another opportunity for the people up top to cash in from mm -hmm. the people it does. down below. So yeah. I yeah. found other info um, that says from January 1 through December 31 of 2022. So just last year, Primerica paid cash flow to its North American sales force at an average of $7,479, which includes commissions paid on all lines of business to licensed what? representatives. Now, I will say 7,500 bucks average is actually considerably higher than some other MLMs. Oh, but big again, time, big time. it just says it's entire sales force, which means that average is including the people all the way at the top and the people all yeah. the way at the bottom. So I, I wasn't able to find more detailed information about like 
what percentage of people, because again, they're quote, not an MLM. So they don't have that disclosure thing on their website the way a lot of places do. Right. But you can only assume that if it's an average that most people aren't making that. You're absolutely right. I mean, that's the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, when you remind that, yes, this is for the entire organization, every level of it. Are you kidding me? This isn't livable income and you are working hard for yeah. that little scrap of money that you're getting because you're constantly having to pitch people on the product and then you have to go to these events because and you don't get the money. residuals from your your own renewed customers yeah exactly you yeah have to... and i would say this is almost like well at least you're not buying you're paying a monthly fee and you're doing buy in doing that buy-in for a hundred bucks but Still, I mean, yeah, I guess you're not spending five grand on LuLaRoe clothing or, mm-hmm. or you know, four or five hundred dollars on, on Avon or Mary Kay. But still, it tries to make itself look more, more legitimate mm-hmm. by selling a product that is highly, highly regulated by mm-hmm. the federal government insurance. And then uh, they, they have a storefront, which makes them look even more, uh, you know, yep. a brick and mortar if you're pre- presenting yourself as a brick and mortar business, people are automatically going to think you're like a H&R Block or something like that. Totally. Look, the, the one near me is in um, a, in a really busy area full of strip malls. It's probably expensive to rent. And it's a freestanding mm-hmm. structure. They have a free strand yeah. in a strip mall, but they've got their own little building. And it's just like, wow. so that RVP or whatever it was called, the regional vice president, those are the people that are supposed to run those brick and mortar places. So yeah. think about how much money that person's making from their downline, if they can afford all that rent and employees and furniture. And it's so curious to me, too, that they are able to play out on the policies that uh, Mm -hmm. that cash in just based on the business model and, you know, how many people are buying in, you know, because insurance is, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, whether it's for your car or for your health or whatever, um, especially here in the United Mm -hmm. States, it's it's everybody pays into a a risk pool, essentially. And so I wonder you know, is that why the premiums are so high? Because the the risk I, I pulls suspect, higher. Yeah, you know? I think you might be right. In fact, I found some info um, that says apart from its insurance is costing up to 29% more compared to other insurers. The main complaints from this MLM come from the sales processing comp- compensation plan. So right there, somebody is saying, and again, I apologize. I did not write down the name of the person. I will get the link to put in the show notes because they deserve credit for the work that they did. So I apologize awesome. to you, person whose name <laughs> I have forgotten. Um, <laughs> so, you will get your credit. Uh, yeah. So um, the uh, now there was another internal document that got leaked and taken away apparently but of course it's the internet things live forever on the internet so um of course so here is stuff new recruits at least were at one time given presumably they must be seeing something similar now i don't know you know it says following our fast track program could have you on the path to earning 30 to 50k in your first year and 150 to 200k plus your second year your first step book 15 kitchen table appointments for your field leader there it is for mm. your field mm. leader in your first 30 days. And um, you should really only approach people after you can actually sell them. Again, why are you giving your upline your best possible sales? Anyways. Exactly. And then it gives exactly. them like a, a telemarketing script and all this other stuff. And, and oh, oh, this was the interesting thing I found that was like, what? It made no sense to me. Um, so this script that is given to these new folks, it actually says that you should not confirm your appointments, that you should just show up, just tell them it's in my calendar. I'm just, I'll be there. And then that of course, give, doesn't give people a chance to cancel or change their minds on an appointment, but you as a rep yep. are probably going to show up to places where the people aren't because they aren't going to show up. And so you're wasting your own time on this as well. Yeah. I mean, you confirm appointments. That is what you do. Like, And in a market that is so saturated, by the way, I have not had a pitch or seen a pitch from them, but I I feel like they probably make people feel like that 
they wouldn't be insured by other people or couldn't be insured by other people. You know that what I mean? Might be. Yeah. I, I will say I have not actually looked at the actual products because again, the products do seem to be legitimate, but again, that's mm-hmm. true of other MLMs. Amway sells it actual is. cleaning products. I mean, Mary Kay yeah. sells actual you wanna, makeup. Like, you want to buy some $15 dish liquid? That's on you, buddy. <laughs> but yeah, you could absolutely have that $15 dish liquid. Is Primerica an MLM? They say no. I say of course they are. And I'm not the only one, Absolutely. obviously. Like, like, I mean, the fact that they just completely tell on themselves and their own federal regulatory filings is uh, that's all the answer you need, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, any time that you're dealing with a, a, a business structure where the only way that you can earn money is by having people beneath you mm-hmm. bringing in the money. And again, we have to reiterate that there are so many people that will hear that and go, how is that any different from a regular company? You have a CEO and you have the employees. You as an employee at, you know, Walmart are not recruiting other employees to come in and that will guarantee you get a paycheck. That's now, not how the only person in a, works. In, a, in a normal organization, a normal employee company organization who might have might have compensation based on recruitment would literally be called a recruiter and that would be their job yes and they would still mm-hmm. be employees and get benefits and all that stuff so there's so many shady ways and to reel people into doing this kind of work you think you're selling uh, a product that seems like it's good, that it mm-hmm. has prestige associated right. with it. Mm-hmm. And so you do that or insurance. Oh, there's there's strict rules gu- uh, guiding me here. And as long as I can sell the policies, great. But you start looking in between the lines. And yeah, uh, even though the FTC and all these other companies have tried to slap Mm-hmm. these regulations on to say you have to disclose all this stuff. Now they have found ways to make sure that they don't even have to proclaim that they're an MLM because of some other legal loophole that yep. some bought and paid for likely by the DeVos family mm-hmm. congressman mm-hmm. and managed to attach to some meaningless bill that nobody is going to ever read. And so now they're able to do shit like this. Yep. Um, and, and that's why we're doing this show and why so many people out there are trying to get the word out about these companies. They're all the same. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter. You can come to me and say, Tupperware is not like that. Uh, I sell 31 bags. I, I like it or whatever. No, 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 no. <laughs> and, and in fact, yep. next week, I, you know, we're, we're, we're going to come at you with some weird, wacky and wild ones that you might not even think are MLMs, but in fact are. Mm-hmm. Um, so beware. A company like Primerica is scary because they the, even the name it sounds like an insurance company absolutely it sounds legitimate it, it it looks legitimate and you're buying life insurance and how bad could it even yep. if it's good life insurance you're buying yep. into a structure that is destructive for the people that are working at the very least exploitive i don't know where the numbers come from so again another stipulation this may not be correct mm-hmm. but i saw that over half of their sales force are men Uh, And Mm -hmm. so this, again, as we said, is one that often targets men and men are the majority of financial services people. At least that's that's my impression, again, from working at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, Everybody in my department was a guy except for me uh, at one point, Um, you know, like Wall Street guys and this and that. So um, my experience is that financial services and people who go out and get these licenses are typically men. And those rings I was telling you about for the different million dollar club and such, they're they're giant dude bro looking rings. Right. They're not delicate lady rings, right? So yeah, it, it, it this is one where men, if you are listening to this or women, if you know a dude who's about to get involved in this, even just have them read their last 10K filing, even if even if they don't want to listen to this uh, this podcast because they they tell on themselves. They really do, and and you know they will rely on people to go. Oh, they're not an MLM. Here's what they say on this website, and then they won't look any further than that. And that's the last person you ever want. It's it's like the government investigating itself. It's like ah yeah we're fine, or the Supreme Court saying oh we can handle our own corruption problems. No, apparently you yep. can fucking not. Exactly. So if somebody you know, has to tell you, oh, I assure you, we are legitimate, then they're probably not legitimate <laughs> on some level. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's something that we should not have to tell. Like if you go look for, I don't know, your grocery store, whatever. If you go look at some business website, a regular normal average business website or J-O-B, as they would say in Amway, mm-hmm. they're 
there's no page on there about, oh, we're not an MLM. We're legitimate. Because because you don't need to say it if you're right. legitimate. Like, honestly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, they're legitimate, I guess, in the sense that they're they're within the law. But the law is terrible. And it's the problem here. Yeah, the laws are not protecting people like mm-hmm. they should. And they're being undermined all around the world. Even the countries that have put down the hardest restrictions on these companies yeah. and, and taking it quite seriously, in fact, are finding ways to be undermined. And you definitely will not find them pursuing people doing MLMs illegally here the way that they do. I mean, they they mm-hmm. really go after people in other countries for doing this Absolutely. shit. Absolutely. And here it's just like, that's just part of life. Well, and Canada, uh, that's how you make money. Canada's the same, unfortunately. I don't think there are any different um, protections here. Canada is um, an interesting hybrid of the UK and the US, as I have learned since mm-hmm. moving here. Uh, and so, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know what the laws would be in the UK. I actually think there's a lot of MLMs in the UK, too. So it might so just be oh, yeah. both aspects of it. But yeah, like there's no protections. And I, I think this is why Primerica's business, well, aside from the fact it literally has America in its title. But I'm sure that's why a lot of why their business is only or mainly in the US and Canada, because that's where they can do it without ramific- uh, bad ramifications, right? Yeah. And oh, I forgot to mention in the Amway thing, they Mm -hmm. actually defrauded the Canadian government. (gasps) They're very bad uh, fraud. Yeah, they actually Richard DeVos and a bunch of them, the upper level could Mm -hmm. have gone to prison for a number of years because they never paid duties or (gasps) uh, tax on any of the stuff they imported into uh, Canada. And Canada finally got one to this and it was like 20, 30 million dollars or something like that. And they actually had to plead guilty in wow. order to not get jail time and uh, DeVos would later on go to say it was just because of some various legal that we had to say that we were guilty even though we really weren't and it's oh like no God. you were literally uh, defrauding the Canadian government of millions of dollars and you were about to go to prison we are <laughs> a large country geographically but a very small one or a fairly small one population wise we need those tax yes. dollars <laughs> I need someone to pay for my health care. That's the deal up here, man. We pay high taxes, but we get stuff for it. And there you go. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's just they pissed off other countries by doing this kind of stuff. They were banned mm-hmm. in India for doing a lot of insidious uh, practices over wow. there. So it's just, uh, you know, but you are seeing it like the UK. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Herbalife is a big one over there mm-hmm. as well as uh, Arbonne. And, and so that's many where of these the body other... shop is an MLM is in the UK, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, yes, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and Australia. So, um, yeah. So, it, it, you know, because Australia, again, yeah, that, another one of those Commonwealth situations right. where they might share some of the same laws on these uh, yep. matters. So this is another two, but we're not done. And we'll we'll be back with our final one. I'm just telling Beverly, just find the craziest shit you can find because we're going to kind of wrap it up. And I'm going to collect questions and stuff from our patrons Mm -hmm. and some other folks that because the people have already been responding. I I put out the first episode of this and and people have really responded to it. And so I'm going to get whatever questions I can for them. And then maybe we can try to answer some and just kind of do a free for all anti MLM free for all. All right. That sounds three. like some fun. And yes, uh, it's gonna be a good time. Excellent. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me once again. I love that we can bond over this issue and hopefully we can help some people. Because, like, honestly, if I could give one message to somebody who's in an MLM and they feel like they can't get out because they believe that it's their own fault, they're not making money or whatever. It's not your fault, friend. It is not your fault. Yeah. You, you should quit. I know it's going to be hard because of the social aspects and the anxieties around money, but you're not, there, there isn't a better thing around the corner. You're going to lose money. And, and it's hard to admit that, but just admit it. Apologize to people. Get your family and friends back. And um, mm-hmm. and just know there's no easy way to get rich because if there was, I'd be rich. I'm lazy, so I'm not <laughs> seriously. <laughs> you know? We'd all be rolling exactly. in it, man. I mean, yeah, yeah. Sadly, there's no escalator to the top of that pyramid exactly. <laughs> for and anybody. I, I just I just think it's important again to share this compassion because I think too often in anti MLM spaces, people 
kind of make fun of the quote Huns, you know, or, yeah. or like the, the people who join. And I, I mean, I get where it comes from, but I, I really have a lot of empathy for them because I know what it's mm-hmm. like to be desperate. You know, like there were times when I lived in the U S tons of times I didn't have any health coverage and I'm diabetic. Right. Or, or right. you know, I mean, I eventually did as I got older and I was more stable, of course, but, but I mean, you know, there were things I considered like, and things I consider joining or whatever when I was desperate. And so I have so much empathy and I want you to know, not everybody is going to think you're a dummy. Come back to your friends and family and, and, and you're going to, you're going to be okay. Yeah. And we completely understand too, that, you know, the optimism and the Mm -hmm. good feelings that draw people into this are an indication of some great personality traits yeah. that are being taken advantage of and, and misused. And, exactly. you know, I, I, I've met some of the nicest people at MLM parties and not just the sellers, but I mean, the, the, uh, the people that I hang out with or, totally. you know, the people they hang out with all of us getting together and, and the people that your friends and family that understand that you're in deep in something, they really want you to come back to them. Absolutely. So please, you know, most people are like sad over the brokenness of mm-hmm. relationships that result from this. So, you know, anybody who gets caught up in a cult like situation like this or otherwise, you know, a lot of the times we're just like, man, we just really want to heal those bonds and get it back together. So come on, guys, you got this. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're not here to cast dispersions on people it's more like i'm just i'm looking up at the top of these structures and really just you know wanting to blow them up yeah and and i know we said that last time but i feel like it needs reiterating because i think people who might feel kind of trapped might might kind of feel like oh i'm embarrassed or you know like like, or or whatever but i mean when you've been snagged by an amway too i mean mm -hmm. my god they're big and everything they've done is in service of Mm-hmm. covering that up and making themselves appear legitimate. Yep, so exactly. So don't don't feel bad that you didn't catch it cuz I mean shit, I'm I'm still learning just researching this stuff and like my god. Mm-hmm. It's amazing that we all haven't been caught up in it in some way shape or form. I mean we kind of have. We always know somebody who knows somebody. Absolutely. That's how, and like like we said is. when we were younger, we ended up at Mary Kay parties and this and that and actually like <laughs> oh god, one time one time I was invited to a stamp party, a stamping party. And I was like, what's that? And they were like, Oh, we're just going to make little cards. And, and even though I was already a little older and starting to catch on, I did not know there was an MLM about this. So I get there and I'm making cards and I'm having fun. I'm like, woo, craft time. Then the sales pitch starts. Turns out there was an MLM called stamping up. I don't know if it still exists, but and then actually, only a few years ago, somebody I met at a co-working space started messaging me. And it was Primerica, actually. I actually just remembered this weirdly. I kind of forgot about it because I forgot about him, frankly, because I blocked him. Because he's like, oh, you know, uh, you could be uh, making this money. And I'm like, yeah, is it Primerica? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, no, thanks. And that's all I said. I didn't say anything bad about him. I just was like, no, thank you. It's not my thing. And he just pushed and pushed and pushed. And then he's like, well, what about your husband? Like, maybe your husband wants to, you know, be like, and I was like, I said no, like eight mm. times, man, like goodbye. And I blocked him, you know, and, and I forgot that was Primerica. Cause again, I put him out of my mind. He was annoying. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So pushing. And, I mean, I've had the, the whole like, Hey, how's it going? You uh, interested in some makeup and Oh, we got mm-hmm. a new thing in. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to pay $50 for foundation or speaking of like unique, that's, mm-hmm. you know, their products are not good. I'm sorry. They're terrible. Mm-hmm. I bought a few from a rep and, and I just to check them out. And I'm like, I've had better makeup from the drugstore aisle at a quarter of the price. Yeah. So, and, and I felt bad that I kind of helped embed her even deeper into her little thing by giving her that dopamine rush of making the sale and then that's going to reinforce right. the dedication. Yeah. And so I, you know, and I know she's probably not in it now. I know a lot of them have, a lot of my friends that get in have gotten out or they've switched over to other ones or whatever. But there's so many of these that are just, uh, if it's a good product, if it's a really, really good product that has passed all the hurdles that need to be, you know, mm-hmm. passed in order to be on a store shelf, then that's probably going to be the one I'm going to buy mm-hmm. as opposed to the one that the that's being sold by a rep at a party well we will see y'all next week and thank you again beverly it's been a blast and uh you know stay away from 
the Amway. <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> this episode was produced by yours truly, Allison Nixon, and wouldn't be possible without the amazing contributions of countless friends, family, and Patreon supporters. Big shouts also go out to Nathaniel Dixon for all the show art, as well as Spencer Morlock and Ken Dixon for the music. I'll be back with something new next week. In the meantime, you know what to do. Be good, you little ding-dongs.